a new, exciting open source blockchain platform has been born. Its core mission is to develop easier and more affordable tools for everyone to be able to create tokens and NFTs. For the first time, we're introducing the innovative Tokel platform, a fully decentralized community-driven project with contributors globally. It offers many new powerful features for artists, content creators, and event organizers, and token owners. Tokel is building the future of tokenization together with the help of Komodo Technologies. Creators and users have the freedom to create, to hold, buy, sell, and trade tokens with ease. Developers have the freedom to build on top of the platform's layer. Tokel has features such as simplified token creation tools, token decks, and NFT marketplace. The NFT creation process has an extremely low barrier to entry. Businesses and individuals can now benefit from the token economy by using tokens in everyday life. A built-in decentralized exchange enables peer-to-peer -peer trading. Tokel.io, the future of tokenization to NFT and beyond. Hello, everyone. I'm me, Giuliano, and it is time for Tokel Talk. And in today's episode, we're, we're going to be talking about tokenization and, and business. Joining us today is Consilience from the Varus community. We're glad that you're here. We're going to have a good discussion today with Consilience and learn more about tokenization, entrepreneurship, and what's possible in the post-trust world. We're also going to be doing an NFT giveaway. So watch out for the form that's going to get posted in the Tokel Events chat channel during the stream. All right, before we meet Consilience, here's Dream Tim with some NFT stats. Dream Tim. Thank you, Giuliano. The number of NFTs sold just in the last 24 hours, actually, is 85,966. In, in just the last 24 hours, we had a trading volume of 135 million. Quite a lot of sales. Now, in terms of the top projects, we had Board Ape Yacht Club, as usually, leading the way with a volume in the last seven days of 57 million, followed by CryptoPunks that did 25 million in the last seven days, followed by Doodles that did 17 million, Pudgy Penguins 7.2 million, and Art Blocks 3.6 million. Now, some other news from the NFT world are that Her Majesty's Treasury in the United Kingdom is working on a new kind of mint, NFTs. So basically, Rishi Shunak, who is the Minister of Finance, has already been criticized for working out plans of creating NFTs amidst you know, a crisis in prices and inflation. Now, in other news... The official Formula One NFT game shuts down and the tokens are now practically worthless, which means that officially backed NFT projects, you know, don't necessarily mean that they're going to last through the course. So this is what I had from the NFT world this week. Thanks a lot, Dream Tim. That's excellent. That's quite some interesting news, especially whenever you get some government related or large nation state related activity it always stirs a buzz and of course uh, anytime there's controversy or drama that also is quite uh, stirring as well anyhow we are here with consilience who has a lot of experience within the space of uh, crypto bitcoin digital assets there are so many names these days that go around but uh, i'd like to introduce your consilience hello thank you so much for being here with us today it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Perhaps could you just introduce yourself for us briefly, what you're involved with? Yeah. My background is I was a banker in the UK uh, in the 1990s. I was running what is known as the equity syndication desk, which is the desk that manages all the IPO business. And in that time, we floated something like 500 or 400 and 90 odd companies and raised about 92 billion dollars and then the year 2000 came around and i spent more time looking at technology companies in the private markets 
And then we were acquired by JP Morgan. And I ended up running the private funds group, which was raising capital, again, equity capital for limited partners and general part from limited partners for general partners in hedge funds, real estate funds, and real, uh, real estate funds, and uh, private equity funds, and VC funds. From there, I started a systematic managed futures hedge fund known as a CTA, a commodity trading advisor. And we were using Bayesian mathematics to machine learning, as it's more commonly known, to look at markets and trend follow and extrapolate essentially a better view of volatility that enabled us to predict the direction of markets, both up and down, and to use computers to trade those markets. And we sold that business to the equivalent of Renaissance Technologies in Europe, which is a company called Aspect Capital. And from there, I invested, became more of a, an entrepreneur outside of the financial realm, but more in the technology realm. And in 2006, seven, I invested in a USB related technology and intellectual property in a protocol that enables you to exchange a public key and a private key or an OTP or a TOTP to create a hardware infrastructure that would make a simple, you know, become a simple onboarding tool for cryptographic type proofs. And then I subsequently spent time working on the next iteration of the web and looking at metaverse technologies, camera technology, just generally being a, an investor and an advisor. And in 2018, I was introduced to the lead developer of Verus, Mike Tatongi, by a mutual relationship. I had been looking for a very long time for a protocol that put identity at the base layer and that would enable a value exchange capability that could interface with the fiat world. And I started, uh, once I saw what Mike had innovated, I uh, started to volunteer my time to advise the Varus community and, uh, and Mike. And uh, that's what I've been doing till now. And we are launching a number of projects on the Varus blockchain, some public blockchains, some multi-currency tokens and, uh, and currencies. My background is in capital formation and my interest is in fully decentralized, distributed, people-powered technologies. Amazing. Quite a background, and, and uh, I definitely appreciate your interests for sure. I think I've heard a post-trust world from you. Do you think you could give us a little bit of an idea of what that's about? Yeah, I think that um, through all of human history, we've had to understand that there have been a, a, a ruling class or an elite uh, or an autocracy. Or in the case of modern uh, modern society, there's authoritarian total surveillance states like uh, we see in Russia, for example. And we also have a technocracy that has data asymmetry over the general population. And we also see that some of our freedoms are also our weaknesses uh, because we see exploits of social media through misinformation and disinformation and confusion of uh, the population such that they can no longer, people can no longer tell the truth, what's true or false. And they can also no longer, since certainly since the pandemic, people have become lacking in trust of their institutions. And sadly, that means that society and civil society and democracy is also under threat. And people, generally speaking, don't trust. So the post-trust world is one where you can verify and then trust. And in our estimation, that is the opportunity of having self-sovereign identities. The reason why Varus provides those identities is such that we can create attestation frameworks that enable us to collaborate and cooperate at scale. And so um, the post-trust world is one where we can work together. We can harness Moore's law and Metcalfe's law for computing and for communications, and that we can exchange value peer-to-peer -peer without going through centralized exchanges and uh, being rent sought. So in your, in your experience so far, um, how do you see the token space developing to support that post-trust world? Well, I mean, I'm, I have, and I've been on podcasts before, and I've had sort of alternating views on tokens and currencies and chains. So 
in general, I will say that tokens and tokenization should occur where the largest group of buyers of that product reside. So if you're trying to do a, a real estate deal and you have a portfolio of multifamily homes that you probably would do a REIT and float it on the New York Stock Exchange. If you were selling your house, you would want to sell to the widest market of buyers or you want to market to that widest group. So I think that anything that is regulated and anything that is subject to regulation will probably find its largest audience in the, in the regulated world, which is just a fact of life. That said, if we're talking about tokenization in respect of novel use cases that are unregulated, that are doing something valuable and innovating new incentive structures, then I think um, tokens are obviously very useful. That's the real thing is that everyone believes that, oh, but just because you have a token, there's going to be a market. But in fact, you really need to be delivering something of value to have a token of value. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I guess, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses are really all about delivering value because it isn't a generally isn't a coerced relationship. And so there has to be something more pure to incentivize that relationship and to make it work. We also have Nutella Lika here today and Kelsey from, from the Tokel team. So uh, Nutella, what do you think so far? W what's going on in your mind from this discussion? Hey, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, Consilience. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Like People have got to be able to draw, drive value to the token holders. And long-term value creation is, is a difficult thing. And I think a lot of creators are you know, finding... Finding that the challenging part, I think a lot of creators you know, creating art these days, I guess in the NFT space specifically, but they're finding it difficult to then create this longer term value or you know, the perception that they have to create longer term value is definitely there. Uh, whether they do that or not is completely up to them. But yeah, that's kind of my initial thoughts. Well, there's no doubt that the tokens and tokenization is going to move forward. And I think the thing that interests me is when I hear about consilience, you're mentioning about novelty and novel ways of providing value and delivering value. You have any thoughts on that, Kelsey? Well, you know, when we think about the value of a token, I, I sort of start to think about all the meme coins. But um, I did want to uh, bring up that in, in the last couple of days, uh, the UK has announced that they're going to be minting the the royal mint will be minting nfts by this summer and um they want to lead the way in crypto but this could also bring digital assets under regulatory scrutiny so what do you guys think about that i mean it's exciting to see you know like countries start to adopt tokenization but just the thought of regulation adoption for regulation is is a bit scary in my opinion i think the use case with the royal mint will be something like a, they do commemorative coins the royal mint uh, you know, mints the coins in the uk yeah i did read too that they are exploring the application of blockchain technology to issue debt instruments so it's <clears throat> i guess it's kind of a interesting time because everything is exploding and but that could soon bring regulation. And I think that's what a lot of people are afraid of. I think it's a, a good chance for a wider audience to understand that this technology is, you know, they're available, trustworthy, because I still think a large majority of the population uh, hears the word NFTs and thinks, what the heck's that? That doesn't make any sense to me. So the more that, and I hate to say it, the more celebrities get on board and the more that these you know, big uh, industries get on board with it, the more education there'll be around it and the more people are more likely to utilize the technologies and then start to join the ecosystem or use it in their day-to-day -day life potentially. So that's also another, you know, positive side that I kind of see to it. For businesses, it's very, very interesting. I mean, there is so many different angles that you can take NFTs and tokenization to take a business to a higher level. First of all, ownership, you know, being able to base your business ownership based on, you know, some NFTs that the members or the founding members hold, that's pretty amazing. Then being able to prove the authenticity of your products 
that is hugely beneficial to to any business as long as that business is obviously you know producing legitimate products you know it avoids counterfeiting it avoids fraud i think there are so many different use cases for business mm-hmm. that haven't surfaced yet yeah that's true and i think again that goes back to consilience point about finding novel ways and i think really as people grow into this technology as well, we will explore those ways. And just looking through some of, actually some of the information on your on your website, uh, consiliencevalue.earth, led me to uh, just ideas about marketing and how these two, these can become tools for businesses and entrepreneurs to, to create value and share value with their customers, let's call them and create relationships that are more interactive. They can change the nature of the focus and attention and also the rewarding of that attention. And and I think this also brings in the idea that the the, the creativity around the use of these tools will will start to grow and and, and find those novel ways of of using it. What do you think about that? I think that there are going to be a myriad of ways that people use code to capture value but it will only happen if you create communities and the creation of those communities and the ownership of those communities is the critical thing and really anything and everything is technically possible so it's really about finding a product market fit like in the real world but the the product market fit is found by the community and not by a company. Otherwise, you still could have company opportunities, of course. And I was just on the phone with um, some corporations, larger corporations. And for them, it's really about sharing value. So there's, those are really the two different things. And if you're in a corporate world, you're sharing value with your customers and your employees, that would be an evolution of value uh, and a different way to share value. So the question for me is really whether we will get a hybrid system between fiduciary responsibilities to maximize shareholder value and whether we can evolve communal systems and communal approaches that are able to capture equal value for communities and collective ownership structures. So, you know, I, I haven't yet seen uh, the perfect solution but I think that you know maybe perfect is the enemy of good. And so I don't know whether one should be fearful of regulation if you're you know doing something that really does involve a centralized entity and a centralized company. I think those those people will embrace regulation, in fact. And so there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of ground to cover. I just think that if incentives are well designed and communities are well organized, there is an opportunity for them to compete against, or there will be a opportunity for them to compete against centralized corporations as Mm. an outdated as an outdated structure i think again you've hit the nail on the head but i also think that there's like a scale or a spectrum of you know people that want to utilize this technology for value creation or dissemination or passing that value on and you know in in your context i guess it's from like the the corporate uh business type space and that's definitely what we're talking about today and then there's also different ways of achieving that through decentralized structures like DAOs and trying to spread, you know, value throughout DAO membership. And there's plenty of ways NFTs can can assist in in that as well. I guess it is interesting to to think about, you know, tokenizing a business or utilizing NFTs and tokens to create more value for your customers or for your community as a business because businesses are inherently centralized which you know if you think traditional blockchain is decentralized then people think oh business is centralized that's bad but as we've seen especially in the nft space there is a ton of centralized businesses that are picking up this nft technology to try and spread that value through through their uh, communities and through their businesses so it's interesting and i don't think that's a bad thing i think you know tim mentioned earlier that an f nft f1 game i think you said had shut down so unfortunately, there's still the reliance on that centralized entity if you are purchasing those NFTs. But the cool thing about it is if the NFTs are on the blockchain, then they're on the blockchain, whether the game runs or not. So if you are really passionate about it, you could potentially create your own game that then incorporates those NFTs. 
they're not destroyed whereas traditional game without nft and token technology they would literally be gone because the servers of the game have disappeared the game is no longer there's no assets owned by the player or or the community uh, in that sense so now the people that hold those f1 nfts that might actually be a historical piece of evidence that you know people there might be value there in some some way shape or form but i digress i think there's a a, a bit of a spectrum of ways people can utilize this technology as you've mentioned to to create spread share value across a range of different businesses communities individuals so it's uh, super exciting indeed it really is and there's there's just so many ways of applying it that it's incredible i even think about just internal business processes I, and how they might also benefit from some tokenization the technology the tools provide more efficiency and effectiveness. And I don't exactly have all the details of how that happens, but it's pretty clear that they are there in a way which is yet to be fully understood. It's it's like, of course, we, we like to use the, the early days of the internet and the email and all of that from before, because it, it is somewhat analogous to new technology that we, fully, we haven't fully realized yet. In a, in a really, in a physical way, we haven't, in a behavioral way, we haven't really realized yet because we haven't brought it into our processes. Consilience, do you have any, uh, any further thoughts around that, about uh, any things that, that, you, that jump around your mind when you think about uh, the ways that your businesses or, or other businesses that you consult for can, can use tokens? I mean, I just, I just see identities being the critical infrastructure and that identities really are sophisticated NFTs because they can do many many things and they can provide attestations, et cetera. And I think that if you're going to inhabit a volumetric internet, whether it's by VR, AR, XR, or any other sort of metaverse involvement, you will need to have a wallet that holds all different forms of value across all different chains and that has a you know market where you know value can clear and all different new forms of value would emerge because that's just the way that evolution works and so you know whether something's valuable or whether it's on a blockchain or whether it's you know the the operating game is dead but the you know the original thing it still exists is all about consensus and consensus amongst people as to what they think is valuable and what they think isn't valuable there are many you know baseball cards that are you know worth nothing but the babe ruth one is worth a fortune you know it's it's all about demand and supply and incentives and so if you get the incentive structures right if you get you know something that's highly demanded and in, in short supply or something that is optimizing for a yield that is increasing you will get people that are interested and if you can trade it you will get people that are interested and so exchange is a fundamental part of human life and as we move away from our total you know our physical incarnations and in, in we have a more physical and digital incarnation and we have avatars and other proxies for uh, ourselves we will find other ways to create seek uh, and trade value and it will be more and more um, specific i would have thought because um because you can so i think mm. you get a fractalization of you know, things that people find themselves in and find reflect the things that they care about and that they value. Right on. Yes, indeed. There, there's just so much involved in the, the conceptualization of all this. And we've talked about some benefits. I'm glad you brought it in IDs and the idea of like an NFT being a key and also storing important information that gets... Uh, processed or transferred in some form or fashion. And, you know, I'm just wondering maybe on the other side of things, if you're noticing any challenges, maybe that you faced barriers to entry that you faced or that you seeing other entrepreneurs or businesses facing when uh, using NFTs, tokens, part of their business model or anything like that. I think that, I think the biggest problem is that in the web three world, the decentralized world, people want simple, easy, use cases and that lends to centralization a la coinbase open etc etc cetera, et cetera. and so the corruption of you know the aims of being decentralized and distributed and people powered 
is the real difficulty and the temptation to go and raise VC money. And then as soon as you raise VC money, that takes you down a, a certain path because they're not going to let you do you know, something that is not in their best interest as well as being fully legally protecting themselves. It's going to be uh, very difficult for them to do that. So what we have is a bifurcation of the community or you know, a constant splitting of the community and the fact that people need money to live and to build projects and very few people are willing to go through the pain and anguish of doing it properly. They'd rather go to a crypto VC or, or a regular Andrewson style VC and sell them an idea. And then, of course, it, it no longer becomes you know, truly people powered. Or maybe it's fine. Maybe the hybrid is fine. But it means that you're really still back in the old system where whoever has more money buys more customers and can build something that a, a, a truly open source people power protocol can't. These are the, these are the sort of difficulties I think that everyone faces if you're trying to build in, the, in this new world. That's a really good point. Go ahead, Nutella, as, as one who's also building in this world. What are you thinking? Yeah, I wrote a post in the in the Komodo Discord, and it was just talking about you know how, how we think about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies in general. But I said people should be looking at the underlying utility of a blockchain, and you know, in in, in our case, tokens and NFT, and really understanding that utility and how that can help you know help the wider ecosystem and help uh, people in general. And that's you know by far more important on a broader scale and increasing that utility and, and collective productivity in whatever form actually brings significant value to that ecosystem. And you know, in the blockchain's case, the underlying cryptocurrency or in the NFT case, the value of that NFT specifically. And I think that's what people, you know, should be focusing on if they're building. But as noble as a thought that is, people generally have like a necessity or a want to focus on those short-term profits and increasing their own individual value over the collective. So I think the mentality for traditional, you know, centralized structures is very much on those uh, short-term profits. And when I say short-term profits, it, it is that, you know, that VC money like you talk about and, you know, the next next thing ahead of them instead of increasing the collective productivity or the collective value of a decentralized community. But I, th I think we still have people in decentralized communities that are thinking about themselves rather than the collective productivity. And then there's also the, the people in there that you know have that idea that, hey, we're just going to put our time and effort in to improve everybody's value across the board. And and that's definitely the, the aim that I'm taking at this. It's like, it's not about one person. It's about the collective and everybody that's involved in Tockle, you know, helping out to make it a better place. So I know we're always reaching out for you know, people's feedback. And that is like a very, very simple thing that people can give that helps, you know, us make things better. And, uh, and we've talked about multiple times where, you know, we've taken that feedback on board and, and turned things around really quickly. So that's uh, definitely something that I focus on in the Tockle ecosystem. I'm not sure if there are any specific challenges that you want to point out, but uh, the other thing that I would like to ask is about uh, advice. Like if you have any advice for entrepreneurs or, or businesses that are getting involved or just recently got involved or looking forward to get involved, but not sure even how to think about it. Consilians, do you, do you have any advice for anybody that might be getting into this space, looking to involve their, their business? Be, you know, these are entrepreneurial minded people. Where do they start if they've never even considered this before, but they know that there's something there that they can I'll find? Give, uh, I'll, give the, I'll give the same advice that Elon gave. If you're an entrepreneur and you need an advice, don't become an entrepreneur, number one, because you need to have a driving force. I'm being sarcastic, of course, but you need to have a driving force that you've got to do this. You know, that this is your mission, because if it's not, you won't succeed because it is difficult. Second part of the advice that he gave was that, you know, the best thing to understand is that being an entrepreneur is like chewing glass. And if you want to be successful, you better get a taste for it. So you need to really want to do something or change something and achieve something because that's what you're going to need to drive people to follow you and to go through all of the ups and downs or the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune 
because it is a tough journey. And if you want to do that in the decentralized world, you better be even stronger because it's fully open. There is no、uh, mandate for leadership. There's only your ability to start running and people to start running with you. So, yeah, I don't mean to be negative, but、um, I think that what Elon said was true. It is tough, and it's essential to find. Even if you don't need a, necessarily a, a co-founder, you need to find people that really also want to do the same thing that you want to do and have a shared vision. Because without it, it's very, very difficult. Thank you. Another thing to add there, which is along the same lines. I was listening to a podcast recently, and the guest was talking about things that they wanted to improve on as a as a businessman, as an entrepreneur. And one of the things they mentioned was not believing they that there's going to be somebody else out there that is going to take their you know their business or their ideas to the next level. Every year, this person would fall into the trap of thinking like, "Oh yeah, if I meet that one person, or this person might be the person that's going to take my business to the next level." And every year. He proved himself that the only person that could actually do that was him. So, for anybody out there, along those same lines as Consilience is talking about, is you are the master of your own destiny, and you are the only one that can take it to the next level. Yes, have really good people around you, and have and you know form good teams, but ultimately, it's it's up to you to go down that path. There shouldn't be any reliance on anybody else there. Right on. Yes, and have that 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 drive. Well, the the other. Point that I was going to be curious about today was asking if there were any regions or countries in the world which seemed more ready for the use or adoption of NFTs and tokens, you know, by entrepreneurs and or as part of their business models. But of course, then we get this this news about the UK and their interest in tokens and NFTs, particularly. So I'm just wondering, maybe though,、um, if you have any thoughts around that, or if you have any ideas of other. Areas around the world which seem to be ready to to adopt、uh, these technologies for for you know entrepreneurially. I think that's very simple. That people adopt any technology if there's significant enough incentive to motivate them. So you need to have high motivation, and it needs to be easy to do. That's called the FOG behavioral model. So ultimately, it's just again looking for product market fit. The actions of the UK government in, you know, an NFT for the Royal Mint or talking about stable coins is really a、uh, realization that if you're not in this new world, you are not going to make it. And the countries now joining and talking about stable coins and this, that, and the other. I mean, a centralized stable coin is just digital, you know, digital money in the same way that. You know, Venmo or, or Apple Pay is digital money. It's not about that, you know. And so these are just distractions, so that they can get the regular Joe to say, "Oh, I, I, you know, I'm using the Sterling stablecoin." I mean, it, it means nothing. It, it's not going to do anything other than make people think that 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 it's the same as a truly decentralized currency, which it's clearly not. So. There are things that are relevant because it shows that it's pushing the whole sector, and it's this blurring of the lines that is also a danger because people are not going to understand why they should do anything unless there is a direct incentive where they appreciate, oh, it's much better for me to use this because I get money versus use that where I get less money, and so I think that will emerge over time, and people should get the best deal. I mean, and wherever they do get the best deal is the technology that they'll use because humans are optimized for you know the fittest decision over a, a narrative. Right on. I'm I'm so glad you mentioned that, and you've mentioned it a few times in this、uh, episode here, and and I think it definitely deserves continuing to hit that point home because there is a blurring and there is a way of co-opting and basically. Making it less clear, like what is even this all about? So it, I'm glad that you, you're continuing to hit home that message to remind us the reminder that this is this is about moving towards a more fair and free way of interacting, and that usually involves cutting out more of the rent-seeking behavior and more of the the middle person behavior. There, if we want to say it like that, and yeah, you know, I I think 
that it's important to remember that this is at, at once a good highlight for the fact that, that there's recognition to NFTs and tokens and, and there's generally the fact that there's a lot of talk about stable coins and that kind of thing is, is exciting because it means that things are evolving and moving forward. But as Kelsey pointed out as well, there's also an element of concern because there is that possibility of blurring those lines and, and shepherding and herding people in towards uh, the less decentralized and less, let's call it, open, free interactions of value. And instead, they're pushed in towards a more, something more re uh, resembling what we currently have, right? Status quo type of thing, just with new, shiny tools. So thank you again for putting home that point. And I think we are pretty much wrapping up for, for today. We've gotten a lot out of this, this episode in, in, uh, in this discussion. But I'm also curious maybe if there are any other um, projects or, or NFTs that, you've, that have caught your eye that you might be interested in, or if you've not really been able to, to focus on that too much, Consilience. You know, I followed the space closely, but um, my interest is in the evolution of the technology and the use of various IDs. So I like, I consider various IDs to be the super powerful NFT that is the next generation. And so I've been looking more at Ferris ID as a, as a better form of NFT investment that has some real utility. That's, that's where I've been focusing my, uh, my, uh, my attention. Excellent. Thank you. Well, we are going to be wrapping up for now. Before we finish, though, I do want to say again, thank you to you, Consilience, for joining us. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. And also as well, of course, Nutella, Lika, and Kelsey for being here and joining in on this conversation today. No worries. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Fun as always. And thank you for hosting as usual. Thank you very much. Yes. And of course, we are not quite done yet. We've got uh, just a little bit of news and information from the Tokel team. So take that away. Yeah. Uh, if everybody hasn't seen it yet, uh, please do go over and check out the new website. The team's put a, a whole bunch of effort into to sprucing that up and, and it's still filling it out so to speak but the, the information displayed and uh, ui of the website is absolutely incredible hopefully everybody can go and, and take a look at that and uh, have a poke around because it's 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 very cool uh the other thing that we've got for the dap we are just about to put the final touches on the release for the time locked funds so for the toggle early adopter rewards plan uh, for anybody involved in that we will have a release that uh, you'll actually be able to see the differences between the funds in your wallet that are spendable that aren't part of that time lock reward. And then you'll see the, the entirety of your time locked funds that are uh, there and not spendable until uh, a certain date. Uh, and as soon as we make that release, we'll then be making the time lock transactions. And just as a reminder, the first unlock for those funds is on the 15th of June this year. And then the second unlock will be 15th of March next year. But keep your eyes peeled for that one. And then also keep your eyes peeled for a potential announcement about uh, the first release of the marketplace. Uh, and that's all I'll say on that one. And that's the biggest news for Tokel. The preparation for the launch of the much anticipated marketplace. We believe that this will have a major impact on the project, on the ecosystem and the community as it will enable trading of tokens and NFTs, resulting in more activity and growth. Yeah, directly in the, GU, the GUI of the, the, the DAP, right? We'll be able to see the marketplace. That's, uh, that's pretty big cool. news. So, so we're looking forward to that one. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pay attention to the announcements for that, right? Other than that, we're going to wrap up the show. But of course, stay tuned for the next Tokel Talk. It's going to feature Proton Planets and, and more. That's on April 19th. And if you're not already, then follow our Twitter. Download the show on Podchaser and join Tokel Discord if you haven't already. And of course, if you are here in the Tokel Discord listening live, thanks for joining us and we hope you enjoy the NFT drop. And if you want to be a guest on a future episode, submit the request form at tokel.io slash talk. Thanks everyone for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Thanks. See ya.